Today I'm going to be uh, just a few things. Somebody reminded me of this. It's uh, the believers in our fellowship made a website, and um, this is called Bread for the Famine, and it has all of the teachings that we've done, but in, they've done in, uh, they put them in an order, and they categorized it, so it's really easy to find. So um, if anybody's interested, you can go there, and you can just look up if you want to see First Peter, Second Peter. They're categorized by books and by topics. And so if you, um, if you wanted to go see this, there's videos, Jacob, myself, other guys in there. Uh, they're wonderful. It, it's different than our YouTube page. This is a separate website, so just so you don't get confused with it. Um, regarding the, the, our YouTube, somebody reminded me of this. It was Zach who reminded me. We've done a, uh, a seven-part series on Midrash. Uh, that it's on our YouTube page. Uh, one of the brothers in the, in the fellowship there, Sergio, uh, developed a seven-part series. Very, very basic things. It's not, um, you, you know, Jacob's like a graduate degree course, and it's a good thing because we learn a lot, but sometimes we have to put the cookies in the bottom shelf where all kids can eat it. And so we took what a lot of what Jacob said and made it very plain and very simple uh, for us to understand. So it's a very introductory level. Uh, many things that Jacob said are there and other things that the Lord has shown us, but it's there and it's, uh, I think it's called just Introduction to Midrash or something like that. So if, um, if, if you'd like to see those, Jacob has a couple of CDs on Midrash as well, and, um, but a lot of the things obviously in, the, in his teachings uh, have Midrash in it, so there's uh, a lot of things you can compare and go back and forth. So anyway, today... Before we pray, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. So let's turn there. And as we turn there, we're going to start. Uh, we'll just read it, and then we'll pray, and then we'll start. 1 Samuel chapter 30 for today. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on Negev, and Ziglag had overthrown... Uh, and had overthrown Ziglag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went to their way. And when David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were there lifted their voices, their voices and wept, and there was no strength in them to weep. Now David had two wives, uh, David's two wives had been taken, Ahinoam and the, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Abimelech, priest, please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar uh, brought the ephod to David. Father, in the minutes we have together, we're so thankful for your word and for this weekend. Lord, you've done so much already. You have worked in our hearts. You have shown us things that we didn't know. You have reminded of things we knew. You have encouraged us to do the things that we knew and ought to do. Please, Lord, as we strengthen the things that remain, we pray that this passage will be an encouragement to all, a reminder to all, but Lord, a looking forward for us all, that we would do the things you called us to do and that we would strengthen ourselves in the Lord because, Lord, you have gifted the body of Christ with many things, especially, Lord, by far, the Holy Spirit. He is the gift. We pray for his strength and his encouragement in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. He gave gifts unto men. What does the story have to do with us today? Strengthen the things that remain. Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, Paul tells us that everything in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is for our learning, for our edification, for our encouragement that we through the scriptures may have hope. Not only do we learn the good things that Israel did and what we ought to do, but also the warnings of not to repeat the things that they did wrong. And so it is written not to us. It was written to the Jewish people in Israel at that time, but it was written for us. Paul is very clear. It's written for us, for our learning. 
edification, exhortation, for uh, as the scriptures is inspired. All those scriptures, especially the Old Testament, as Paul is addressing it, the New Testament wasn't written yet. It's inspired. All it's inspired, but he's referring to the Old Testament. And it's for us to learn and understand the things of God and how God de dealt with the people of God at that time. And so when Paul's explaining this, all these things are, when we read the Old Testament, they're to be reminders of the New Testament. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, we're told about the spiritual battle. Let's turn there very quickly so we get the flavor of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Familiar verse. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist it in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having gird your loins with truth. And he goes and explains the full armor, putting on the full armor of God. The battles in the Old Testament, based on the New Testament understanding of battles today, are a reflection of a spiritual battle, a reflection of a spiritual uh, confrontation. We, we're not fighting the battles like Israel did. There's not the Amalekites and the Ammonites anymore. Those battles were real. They were there. But they were to teach us something about battle, about warfare. Our battle and our war, it's not a physical war. It is a spiritual battle. Can we learn something from these battles of Israel? Can we learn something from these confrontations with evil, with these with this nations that worship pagan idols, in order to understand it and apply it to our lives? The answer is yes. We can learn something from them because Paul says our battle is spiritual. These battles, although they, they, they really happen physically, they are a reflection of a spiritual battle behind the scenes. Remember the story of Hur and Moses and Aaron? Joshua is in the battlefield, and as Moses is lifting up his hands, they were winning. As soon as he stopped, uh, or as soon as his hands got weary and tired, they started losing. And here comes uh, Hur, and here comes Aaron, and they held up his arms, and they, they, they held them up, they strengthened. By the way, that's the, a word for faith in that, in that passage, is that he held them up, he steadily, he steadied his hands, and it's the word for faith. It's one of those key words about faith that we forget, that it's faith is not just intellectual, but there's an action and a steadiness about our faith. So anyway, for another stu uh, study for another time. But in 1 Samuel, we have this story. The life of David teaches us a lot about ourselves. David, when he is wrong and he does wrong things and he sins, he acts like us. When he's right with God and he walks in the Lord and in the fear of God, he looks a lot like Jesus. In fact, he is one of the illustrations, one of the types, one of the figures of Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus is called the son of David. There's no doubt about that David uh, in many ways prefigures Jesus. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of all of Israel. He's crowned. He's actually uh, crowned twice in the, in, the, in the book of Samuel. All these things are reflections of what Jesus is going to do. And of course, uh, David uh, the lineage of Jesus, he comes from David. He's the son of David, born in Bethlehem, all these things. He's the root of Jesse, the Messiah's the root of Jesse, the fa father of David. They all come from David. David's just this beautiful picture of Jesus when he's right. When he goes off, he acts like me. <laughs> he acts like you. And so we have to look at David in that category. We, have, we can't say everything he did is like Jesus because he didn't do everything right. And he didn't do everything wrong either. He had some great, great moments of victories and moments of amazing spiritual, uh, spirituality, just growing in the Lord and finding refuge in him. And the Psalms tell you so much about it. You've been encouraged by his Psalms because the Psalms are a reflection of his dependence on God. But here's a battle. And let me give you the context of this battle because it's quite interesting. David shows up after the battle is over. He shows up after the battle is over, and it's been basically about 10 to 12 years since he's entered Saul's court by this point. And he's still running from Saul. And the circumstances of this chapter, um, it's quite of an interesting thing because it's going to describe the fall of Saul and the ascension of David. 
But David has been on the run for some time already. He's been on the run, and um, like I said, he's just a man like us, but he's been hiding. Um, and here's the cave of Adullam, at least where they believe it is. There's so many caves there. If you've been to Israel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But everything that he does at this time happened to him in pairs. Happened to him in pairs. He twice flees from Saul. He twice didn't kill Saul. He could have, right? Uh, twice uh, they threw spears at him, and he fell twice into, Ake, uh, into the Philistine territory. And that's when he wasn't seeking the Lord. He was just running. He was just running, 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 running. We'll show you some examples. In fact, uh, let's turn one right now. Chapter 21. Chapter 21 of Samuel. Um, I guess here in England we call him 1 Samuel. In America we call him 1 Samuel, so apologies. 1 Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 21. Look at verse 8. Now David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a word on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Then the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Then David arose and fled, uh, and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Achish, the king of Gath. Now, here's a fascinating story. David is running from Saul. He's trusting in God, but he gets to the point where he runs into uh, the priest and he says, I'm here. Now, is there not a spear or sword in my hand? Yes, there is. There's actually a, uh, a sword, the sword of Goliath. But it says... The ephod is wrapped behind the ephod. The sword was wrapped behind the ephod. And they said, take it for yourself. And David said, there's none like it. Give me the sword. And he takes the sword. What did he go past in order to get the sword? Was the ephod. Now, what was the ephod all about? The ephod was, of course, was an instrument. So it was the priestly garments you, you sought the Lord. This is how you sought the Lord in those days. Remember, there was this, there was this big con uh, confrontation, and uh, eventually the priest goes with David, and he leaves Saul, and Saul is left, uh, has no way of communicating with God, and therefore consults the medium. But in here, David has a chance to consult the Lord. He has a chance to seek the Lord through the ephod. What does he go after? The sword. There's an interesting thing here, and he runs to Philistine territory. He runs to the Philistine territory. And so David, instead of seeking the Lord, what, you know, many times you see David seeking the Lord. What should I do, Lord? And the Lord shows him, and he does it. And there's a point here in chapter 30 when he does it again. But here's an example. There's no mention of him seeking the Lord. Grabs the sword, heads to the Philistine territory. And in the Philistine's territory, there's all kinds of things happening to David. Right? He lies, he manipulates, he doesn't tell the truth to the king. He's got this whole controversy going on. He's not even in Israel. At one point, he's even thinking about coming against Israel. Right? He's going to join the enemy's forces and come against Israel. And uh, let's go to chapter 27 very quickly. In verse 1. David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Um, verse 2. So David arose and crossed over, and the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Boak, king of Gath. And David lived in Achish at the time, he and his men, with his household, even David with his two wives. So now, David is in Lachish. David is in Philistine territory. He's does, he doesn't have the ephod yet. He's not seeking the Lord. He's lying, manipulating. All kinds of things are happening to him. And yet he's in the enemy's territory. And there's a battle that's going to happen. But it doesn't happen because later on in the chapter, the Philistine says, no, we're not going to trust David. He might take us into the battle and then betray us there. And we don't trust him. Remember, he's still a Jew. He's still an Israeli. Uh, let's, let's not trust him at all. And there's this big controversy with the Philistines where the princes don't trust him, they don't like him, they want him out. And so, of course, the king wants him on his side because he's probably thinking like, hey, we got the guy that used to lead the army. He's a great asset to our army. But then they kick him out. Miraculously, they kick him out. It's by God's grace they kick him out. Otherwise, he would have, uh, um, he would have done something perhaps he never wanted to do. That's in chapter 29. The Philistines mistrust David. They don't trust David. 
and so they kick him out. So David, in this, in, in this sort of sequence, this is background to the story, has gone into the Philistine territory, has taken the sword, has not sought the Lord, has resorted to lying, manipulating, getting through. He's on the enemy's side. They're coming against Israel. And by God's grace, they don't trust him, and they kick him out. And now he's in no man's land. He's sort of like a guerrilla warfare. He's not even, he's part of the Israeli army, but he's not really with the king. And he's not with the enemies of God. He's not with the Philistines. Now we get to chapter 30, and something had happened by this time. Something happened by this time. Let's read verse 1 again. When David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day, the Amalekites made a raid on the Negev and on Ziglag and overthrown the city, Ziglag, and burnt it with fire. By the fact that he wasn't there, by the fact he had been running around, not seeking the Lord, something tragic had happened. Ziglag had been overtaken by the enemy. The people of God had been attacked, and David was not there. He avoided the fight with Saul. He didn't want to fight with Saul. He kept running. He resorted to deception to get his way. Now there's a problem. The enemy has come into the territory, and he has now taken captive. Verse 2, they took captive women, all who were small, great, without killing any of them, and carried them off on their way. This is tragic. This is very, very tragic. And it happens that this is one of the turning points in David's life. This is a very, very key chapter in, in David's, and we get into uh, uh, 2 Samuel shortly after this, and there's the death of Saul, and then David becomes king shortly after. But this is a critical time in David's life. It says in verse 3, When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. This happened because of David's sin. This happened because of David's uh, inability to lead and inability to be there for God's people at the time. He ran away, didn't seek the Lord, took matters into his own hands, resorted to lying, resorted to all kinds of schemes, and now the proof is in the pudding. On the third day, it says in verse 1, when you begin to see things like this in Scripture, there are little hints, little breadcrumbs that God is giving us about something that is going to happen. Third day, and it happens many times in this chapter, are highlights, prophetic highlights of what's coming on the third day. And of course, I don't have to remind you guys, the third day is very important in the New Testament. It's the day of resurrection. But it's not the only time this happens. Third day happens quite a bit in the Bible. In fact, uh, on the third day, it was the time where Abraham and Isaac went up to Mount Moriah. On the third day is when God grew vegetation out of the ground. Out of the ground came life, right? And... Um, in Sinai, it's when the Lord came down the mountain and cut a covenant, right? Third day, third day, third day, third day, the day of the resurrection. It's a little breadcrumb God gives us there to say, something may be coming up ahead. And it's sort of an exciting thing, isn't it? When you see these little highlights coming up, we don't know the end of the chapter yet, or maybe you've read it, but God is leaving you a breadcrumb and saying, keep reading. Something may happen that is going to come out of death into a new life. Let's keep reading. Verse 4, David and the people who were with them, lifted up their voices and wept, and there was no strength in him. Oh, this is bad. Um, by the way, this is typical Amalekite uh, behavior. You go after the weak. You go after the women. You go after the children. You go after the ones who are sick. This happened in the wilderness as well. Uh, enemies of God will come against those who are weak. Remember, this is a spiritual battle. It's a reflection of the spiritual battle. It happened really... It really happened in history. But for us, we're not engaging in this type of battle. We're engaging in a battle that is far more sinister. It is the battle of, against the enemy. We don't battle against the government. We don't battle against people. This is a battle of, it's a spiritual battle. It's a battle against demonic forces, and it's a spiritual battle requires spiritual weapons. The Amalekites, like a type of demonic spirits, a type of uh, satanic spirits who come, and they, of course, always attack the families always attack the women, always attack the families, always attack the innocent, always attack those people that can't defend themselves sometimes. David should have been there, and he wasn't. And many times this happens to families where 
the man, the husband, uh, the protector of that home, their home is not there, and the enemy comes and begins to attack. If you ever seen a fellowship, families get attacked first. Marriages get attacked first. Why? If they can get that marriage to be at odds with each other, then it becomes weaker. You're only as strong as your weakest marriage. That's any church and any fellowship and any time and any place. You're only as strong as your weakest marriage. And if your marriages are strong, then the fellowship's going to be strong. If your families are strong, then fam the fellowship's going to be strong. But the enemy loves to go after families. Now look at society. Children, families, marriage, all these things, right? Gender identity to kids, curriculum to kids, uh, LGBT marriage and all that stuff. It's always against marriages. It's always against kids. It's always against families. It used to be, you know, the, uh, in America it was the family state. Everybody loved family, conservative families. Now it's not about families. Oh, they have a redefinition of families. But that's the enemy. It comes against God's people and that they're taking captive. They're taking captive in such a way that now they're not in Ziglag. They're taken to another city. David shows up in verse 4, and they weep. They weep so deep, it says there was no strength in him. This was a tremendous loss, a tremendous battle, a tremendous turn of events. Verse 5, David had two wives, and they'd been taken captive. Jezreelites, Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. Verse 6, moreover, David was greatly distressed. David was greatly distressed. The people spoke of stoning him. And all the people were in bitter, each one, because of his sons and his daughters. But David has strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, this is very important. The Lord had clearly stopped speaking to Saul. There's no doubt about it in the previous chapters. He no longer spoke to Saul. Saul could have sought the Lord, but he didn't. He disobeyed the Lord. And later on, he actually consults a medium in the name of the Lord. Remember, the witch was even skeptical of Saul. You're going to kill me? You're going to burn me? As the Lord lives, nothing bad's going to happen to you. How do you do that? <laughs> I'm, con I'm consulting the occult, but in the name of the Lord, right? But you see that today. New Age and churches and everything, it happens. They're thinking they're Christianizing New Age and Christianizing the occult, but it's really not. It's really not. And you see that, in, especially in our state, Redding, California, Bethel, they, they resorted to tarot cards to seek the Lord and to pray and teaching kids how to do tarot cards in the name of the Lord. Now, Christian tarot cards. How about that? You, ever want, you want some for Christmas, Chris, uh, Christian tarot cards. Well, they have them. Well, he, they weren't the first ones. Saul sought the witch of Endor in the name of the Lord. As the Lord lives, nothing bad's going to happen to you. Now, Knowing Deuteronomy, knowing the law, they should have, he's the last place he should have been there. However, he was seeking the occult because God was no longer speaking to him. Now, it wasn't that God, God had stopped talking to him, but he knew what the Lord had told them right before he stopped talking to him. The last thing Saul knew is you've been rejected as king and David is king. And that's the last thing Saul knew from the Lord. But what did he do with that information? He rebelled. He rebelled. And, and, and you know, every, I'm, I'm assuming that every time he went to pray, the only thing he heard is, let David be king. Let David be king. And what did he do? No, no, no. And he went after David and tried to kill David. God speaks to the man who cares. Remember we talked about that? Well, here's Saul who hardened his heart against God, and no longer God spoke to him. And he went so far as consulting a witch, consulting a medium. But David had the opportunity to seek the Lord. And we'll see that in a moment. Remember in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, don't harden your heart against the Lord. And the day that you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. It's a very, very important principle in Samuel about seeking the Lord, hardening your heart, and then God not speaking to you. And then repentance, seeking the Lord, and then God speaks to you. And it's, 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 it's teaching us the contrast, right, between Saul and David. But there's more. God speaks to David now. God's going to speak to David, and David knows God's will, but he hasn't been seeking God's will for the past uh, you know, few chapters. He's been running away. But David goes back to the high priest. It says in verse 6, the people spoke of stoning him, and they were embittered against him. Now, this happens to a lot of Christians. It's not just the enemies who come in and attack and take away, but now it's the people that are closest to you who become against you. 
and I don't, maybe a show of hands, I won't ask for a show of hands, is this has ever happened to you? Yeah. It's one thing when the enemies come and they attack you. You expect it, you know it's a spiritual battle, you kind of see it coming sometimes, and you know, okay, we're seeking the Lord, we're getting close to God, we expect to be attacked. It's another thing when it happens within your own people, and they blame you for it. And now you are the cause of why this happened. Verse 6, the people spoke against David, and they spoke of stoning him, not just against him, but they wanted to kill him. His own people wanted to kill him. He's probably thinking, why did I even come back? Why did I even come back and help him? They even want to kill me. They even want to kill me. And this is a climactic point in David's life because it says here, David, um, they thought of stoning David, verse 6, and all the people were embittered against David. Now, what do you do when people are against you, they want to kill you, they want to attack you, they're embittered against you. What's the one response you should have, right? Attack them back. Pick up stones and let's go at it, right? That's the, that's the natural thing to do. Well, that is the natural thing to do. I guess in a sense of the old nature, you want to fight back. You ever, you ever argue with your wife or with your loved ones and they bring up something and then you bring something up and then they bring something up and then they bring something up. Something happened 10 years ago and you keep going back in time and I thought you forgave me about that. It's 15 years later and... and <laughs> People become embittered. And the response is, when somebody attacks you, natural response is, hey, fire back. Here we go. You deserve it. Let's read what David did. Verse 6. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, this is, this is a tremendous thing because here, David, it's becoming a type of Jesus again. He's going to become like Christ. He's been like us. He's been lying, getting away with things. He's been running away from God. Has been seeking the Lord. But then here David becomes, he, he's humble now by this. And becomes like a type of Jesus because Jesus now suffers with his own people. David did not pull himself out of the situation and says, well, it's your problem. I, I, I've been with the Philistines. You guys, you guys should deal with this. You guys should have defended yourself. He comes and he weeps with them. He comes and he cries with them. He had suffered loss, but he also they suffer loss. And he identifies with them in such a way that these trials are going to strengthen David. These trials are going to strengthen David. And it's an interesting thing because out of this trial, David becomes a real, this is a pivotal moment in his life. He becomes strong, a trial, something tragic, something that would have embittered many people. Your family's gone. People are against you. They're talking about killing you. They're embittered about you. Even your own friends are against you. It could have driven anybody to bitterness. But he does something. People get bitter, but he didn't. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Jacob talked about this earlier this week. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. On my first defense, Paul says, no one supported me, but all deserted me, and it may not be counted against him, but the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, in order that through me the proclamation may be fully accomplished, and all that the Gentiles might hear, I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. Now here's Paul at the end, almost the same thing. People had come against him. People spoke against Paul. Remember, Paul had dealt with this his entire ministry. You're not an apostle. You're not a real apostle. You're not one of the 12. Your ministry's weak. You're weak. And he has to defend himself in Corinthians about his real apostleship. He really did see the Lord. He had this revelation. It was true. But his concern was for the people. His concern was for the people of God. And here David goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 30. David is there. And he trusted and sought the Lord in this crisis. My friend, if we're going to strengthen the things that remain, this is a vital, pivotal understanding and application for you. You want some real life application? Here's one of them. When everything's against you, when everything's, everyone's against you, the ministry's against you, bitterness comes in against you, people want to kill you, maybe you never got to that point. I'm sure Jacob's gotten that. I'm sure I've gotten that. People just want to stone you, kill you, drag you out. Don't get bitter. Don't attack back. 
strengthen yourself in the Lord. He sought the Lord. Now, what did the Lord tell him? Verse 7, David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, please bring me the ephod. Should have grabbed the ephod a couple of chapters ago. Maybe he could have avoided all this. Remember, the ephod was the, the garments, right? That the, that the priest, that's how you would seek the Lord. But David prays and he seeks the, he seeks the high priest. Remember, he had the ephod with him. He seeks the Lord and bows the knee and he says, okay, I need to consult the Lord now. Consult the myself, consult the sword. Now it's got to be the Lord. And the priest said, please bring me the ephod, David said. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake him? And he said to him, pursue. You shall surely overtake him, and you will surely rescue them all. Oh, God begins to speak to you. Isn't that refreshing? I don't know how he felt the first few chapters, but I'm sure it was like a dry land. God hasn't spoke to you in an hour. God hasn't spoke to you in a month, and you're just like, what is wrong? with me but here's David the Lord speaks to him and then he asks a question very specific question it's very important to think about this Lord what do you want me to do where do you want me to go and the Lord answered and the Lord when you seek the Lord in humility when you don't get bitter when you don't become an antagonist against others when you attack others um, God wants you to humble yourself God wants you to humble yourself seek him then the answer comes you see that? Then the answer comes. I'm sure David said, let me have the sword. I'm going to go grab him and kill them all. I don't think the Lord would have spoken to him this way. Verse 8, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue? Yes, pursue. Verse 9, so David went and he and 600 men who were with them came to the brook of Besor where, um, where those left behind remain. So David pursues and he crossed the river Besor. Now, in, in Hebrew, this is again, this is not a Hebrew class. Jacob should be teaching that class. But Besor in Hebrew means good news. Good news, right? Besor. It is the equivalent, we would say, of the gospel or evangelion in the New Testament. Besor, good news. He crosses the good news and he pursues the enemy. Remember, this is a spiritual battle. It is really a physical battle, but a spiritual lesson for us. Go back to the gospel. Go back to the things that you know and understand. And he brings 600 men with them. In this case, he went with them through the brook of Besor, right? It's like discipleship, right? You go through Besor. You go through the river Besor, right? You go through this area and through the brook. It's not just to the brook, but uh, through the brook, but you have to cross the brook. You have to get past the brook. It's like the gospel. You come to the gospel, but you've got to go through it. You've got to keep going. And the first place you go, when you hear the gospel, the good news, you've got to get baptized, right? You have to find baptism. And as a new believer, you hear the gospel, come to the gospel, go through the gospel, enter through the water, come out the other side. Then the battle begins, right? Because that's where the battle has to go. David has to go through just the understanding, the very faithful understanding of scripture, the, the, the gospel, the very simple message. Go through the gospel, through the water, come out the other side, and now verse 10, David pursued. Now the battle begins. The battle belongs to the Lord? Absolutely. David is going to go lead the troops now. He's the, leading the troops. Verse 10, he pursued them, he and 400 men, for 200 men who were exhausted to cross the brook of Besor and remain behind. Now it looks like his uh, army is a little bit smaller. It's not the 600 men anymore. I would feel much more comfortable with 600 men, wouldn't you? Now you cut down to 400, maybe I'm a little more thoughtful now. The battle belongs to the Lord. This sounds like Gideon, right? God is cutting down his army because it's not about the strength of David. God never wanted David to rely on his strength, but the strength of God. He will give you the victory, and it may be with very few people. And he's going after the Amalekites. Verse 11. They found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread. And, and he ate. And they provided him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of fig cake and two cluster of raisins. And he ate. And his spirit came alive. For he had not eaten or drank water for three days and three nights. A little breadcrumb again from the previous one. Something is, we're getting closer now. It's not just three days. It's three days and three nights. Eyes are opening. 
This is about resurrection. This is about new life. David has found the Lord. He's now the king of Israel, leading the army, seeking after the enemy, seeking after the enemies of God with the word, through the gospel, through baptism, on the battle, other side. And he's leading the charge, and he finds, does he find a, a Jewish person? Who does he find? A Gentile. And the king of Israel has mercy. He has mercy on an Egyptian. I don't know what Saul would have done if he found an Egyptian like that in the battlefield, but you can take a guess. It says in verse 13, David said to him, to whom do you belong to? And where are you from? He says, I'm a young man. I am an Egyptian, a servant of the Amalekite. My master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. He was left to die, completely dead. He, was, he belonged to the enemy. That's it. You belong to the enemy? Off with your head. We made a raid in Negev, the, Cher, uh, the uh, Carathites, and that which belongs to Judah, and Negev, and Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. Then David said, will you bring me down to this band? And he said, swear to me by my God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you into this land. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing. Mm -hmm. David has mercy on an enemy, a Gentile, and he brings him into the fold. David becomes more and more a picture of Jesus, the king of Israel, leading his army, bringing Gentiles, Egyptians, into the fold, joining his army. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. We used to sing that song when I was a kid, right? I'm in, are you in the Lord's army? Well, he just joined. He just joined. The Egyptians just joined the Lord's army. It was under the king of Israel, King David. And they go and they come into this battle, verse 16, and they were spread all over the land. How are you going to win with 400 men plus David plus a Gentile coming into the, into the army of Israel, right? But this is what the Lord is, has them to face. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a battle. By the way, Beryl, how much time do I have? I just want to make sure I'm sensitive to that. What do I got? Oh, man. All right. Can I do this? I have no confidence in myself. And if, the, if my fellowship was here, they would laugh if I tell you I'm going to finish in 10 minutes. But I would do my best. The battle belongs to the Lord. There's a battle. There are enemies. Three days, three nights, David has found new life. There's resurrection power in David's life. He finds a Gentile, brings him into the kingdom. And now the enemies are dancing. They're drinking. By the way, there, was, there would have been some kind of pagan ritual because they would be worshiping their God. They would be worshiping. And, and remember, there was always a God against your God. It was the God of the Amalekites versus the God of Israel. And it was always this battle, it was always this thought in, in the ancient world, my God's stronger than your God. So when we conquer you, it's like our God is bigger than your God. And uh, we saw that in, the, in 1 Samuel when they conquer the ark and they bring it back to the Philistine country. Verse 17. And David slaughtered them from twilight until evening until the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels on, and fled. So David recovered all the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives, but nothing of theirs was missing, whether small, great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. Notice these little details. It's not the army brought it all back. David did. So David capture all the sheep and all the cattle which the people drove all to the livestock and they said this is Israel spoil this is David spoil David 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 why is the emphasis now on David by the way because it's emphasizing the king of Israel it's a picture of Jesus he does the battle he brings the spoil he wins the battle he takes the enemies he brings you back he brings the an Egyptian into the fold and by the way there's only these four verses about the battle but the chapter's not done. It's over. David won the battle. Amen? David won the battle. We should close our Bibles. Chapter's over. That's it. The battle's the most important thing, right? Actually, the rest of the chapter, it's all about what happened after the spoil was taken. It's an odd chapter because the battle's over. I, I would have ended it right there. Ooh, we won. Spoils are us, right? Spoils are us. Everybody have fun. Verse 21, David came to the 200 men who were exhausted to follow David and would have been left at the brook of Besor, and they went out to meet David and meet the people who were with them. And David approached the people and greeted them all. Shalom. And he greeted all the wicked and all the worthless men. Among those who went with David answered and said, because they did not go with us, 
We will not give them any of the spoil we have recovered except the very man, his wife, and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. And David said, You must not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us and what has kept us and delivered into our hands the ban that came against us. And who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be to those who stay by the baggage. They shall share alike. And also be from that day forward that he made a statute, an ordinance for Israel to this day. Well, what happened here? There were some, some evil and worthless men, as described here. Some wicked and worthless men come from among David from the battle, and they said, as they're dividing the spoil, hey, you get none because you didn't go to battle. And they had a point. Some people had stayed by the baggage. Some people had stayed by the other stuff, so they would kept it safe. Some people went into the battle. Some people stayed and kept it safe. David said, no, my brothers. Call them brothers. It shall not be so. He who goes to the battle and he who stays by the stuff to protect it gets the same share. And he made an ordinance. Now in the Torah, this was true. In the Torah, uh, there, there was a way to share the spoils. It was, it was allowed in the Torah. But David said, he makes a statue and says, those who go and those who stay get the same share. And those wicked men, I think, had nothing to say. What is this a picture? Remember, David is becoming like Jesus now. And now he gets to the point where he says, okay, the battle belongs to the Lord. He won the spoil. Everybody gets a share. Whether you went out to battle against the enemy or whether you stayed home and protect the people, you get the same share. And it was an ordinance. This is exactly what Jesus taught in the book of Matthew. This is the parable of the vineyard. In the parable of the vineyard, is a fantastic story. I don't have time to dwell into it too much. But it is the parable that defines grace more than any other parable. And it's the parable of the vineyard, the landowner, right? And these were the men who came and worked only one hour, they said. And you make them equal with us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day? It's a fascinating parable because it's a landowner who hires people at 5 in the morning. And they start working for a wage, and then he hires people all along the day, and just before sunset, he brings other people in to work, and at the end of the day, everybody gets the same wage. And I've had people who say, see, that's a very socialist, communist <laughs> parable, right? Everybody gets the same wage. And I've had people in America say, this is a good parable. See, Jesus is a communist. He's a socialist. <laughs> And I had people that like capitalism, and they say, duh, this is a total capitalist. You know, Jesus is a capitalist. Look what it says. It says the owner decided how much to pay each one, and nobody told them what to do. <laughs> so you got a socialist and you got a communist, I mean, a, a capitalist, who say who they attribute this parable to their own ideas. But it's not about capitalism, sorry to say, and it's not about socialism. It's about grace. It's about grace, my friend. It is the grace of God, right? It's the grace of God, the goodness of God. It is the, he's the landowner. And whether you've come to Christ 20 years ago or 30 years ago or within the last 10 years or within the last two minutes or within the last 10 days or within the last, maybe in this conference, you get the same grace, same access to God, same Holy Spirit, same Jesus, same Savior. And that's as taught in Samuel. David said, those who get, those who go on to battle, and those who stay, get the same reward. We get the same reward, the same grace, same mercy. And by the way, this is such a beautiful thing about missionary work too. Those who go out, right? Those who go out are to be supported. And, and praise the Lord for missionary organizations. Moriel supports a lot of missionaries, but also the fact those who stay back, those who stay back and watch over the sheep. Right now, I get to come out to England and see you guys. But elders of the church, deacons of the church, they get to stay back and they watch over the flock at Community Church of the Vore. The reward in heaven will be the same for them that stayed back as I came here to share your word with you. It's the same reward. God's grace is so efficient. He is so good. And he's teaching us through David. But there's more. And I'll finish with this. 
David went to Ziglag, verse 26, and he sent some of the spoils to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Behold, a gift from you and the spoils of the enemies of the Lord. And those who were in Bethel, and those who were in Ramoth, and Negev, and those who were in Jatir, and those who were in Error, and those who were in Sifmoth, and those who were in Eshtemoah, and those who were in Rakal, and those who were in the cities of the uh, Jeremalites, and those who were the cities of the Canaanites, and those who were in the Hormah, and those who were in Barshana, and those who were in Atta, and why is it go on and on <laughs> the spoils of David he the king gave gifts unto everybody four verses on the battle the rest of the chapter it's on the kindness of the king what did David go out around and do he gave gifts to men and this is a picture of Christ turn to Ephesians chapter 4 please and we'll be shortly done Ephesians chapter 4 the king after the battle it's so kind and so mercy, merciful that he decided to give everybody in the land a gift. Everybody that belonged to the people of God. Verse 7, but to each one of us, Ephesians 4, 7, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Oh, isn't he good? Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led captive hosts of captives. He led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts unto men. As David went around, won the battle, conquered the enemy, resurrection, three days, three nights, comes on the scene and says, I have conquered the enemy. They're my spoils. I've done it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. He's washed it white as snow. But it's more than that, doesn't he? He just doesn't forgive your sins. He gives you a gift, the Holy Spirit. And he pours it out. But then from the Holy Spirit comes these amazing gifts as well. We have 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. We won't get into those, but here's a list. Verse 9. Now the expression, as he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended to the lowest parts of the earth? When he descended in himself, uh, when he who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a measure, to a mature man, to the measure, stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed to and fro by the waves. And it gets into how to avoid false teaching and things like that. But this is the king. And he gives gifts unto man. And he pours out his spirit upon all of us. And of course, it happened on the day of Pentecost. And by the way, my friend, don't ever think Pentecost as just a historical event. You know, where people say, oh, it happened in Acts 2, and we always think about it around, you know, right after Pentecost or Passover, Pentecost comes, and we just remember that that's the day it happened. My friend, if that's all it ever did, then it just becomes a historical, fossilized event. The Holy Spirit is not just a doctrine. He is a person, dynamic in your life, and God has poured out onto the body of Christ. Who gets the Holy Spirit? Those who went to battle, not only them, those who stay back. It's for all men who believe. It's for all who believe. And he gives gifts unto men. And this is the critical part. The king of Israel has gifts unto men, unto you, unto my, myself, unto Jacob and Moriel. There's gifts. There's callings. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. What is the purpose? For the edification of the body of Christ. It's not unto you, but it's for the body of Christ through the person in which God is operating through the Holy Spirit. My friend, I'll leave you with this because we have to finish. Jesus is coming back. But he wants to strengthen those things that remain before he comes back. Because we're going through, we're going to go through a stretch where we're going to depend so much on the Holy Spirit. If you haven't depended on the Spirit lately, well, the battle is going to come. The, the enemy is going to come, and he's going to come after your family. He's going to come after your wife. He's going to come after your husband. He's going to come after your church. He's going to come after your fellowship if, ha if he hasn't already done so. Don't resort to worldly tactics. Don't lie, cheat, manipulate to try to get away with things. Seek the Lord. Humble yourself. Don't be embittered about the things that are going on in your life. Even if people come against you, even if Christians come against you, seek the Lord. 
The battle belongs to the Lord. It is David's spoil. It is Jesus who wins the battle. He overcomes the enemy. We get to fight alongside with him because our battle is not a battle of flesh and blood. It is a spiritual battle with the full armor of God, fully engaged. But it's the Holy Spirit operating in the person through gifts, through callings. And so now I say to you this, if you have gifts, if you have callings, if the Lord, if the Lord has poured out his spirit, are you using them? Are you using them? Are you strengthening the things that remain? Because we're going to need a lot of strength. But a strength is not from us. It's from the Lord. It's from the Spirit. It's from the gift that God has given you. Lots of gifts, I believe, here. Lots of callings. Lots of ministries. Is it being in operation right now? Do you want to be in operation right now? Do you want the Lord to use you? But the thing that's going to be most important is to strengthen the things that remain. And that's what um, Ephesians 4 was talking about. To strengthen the body. To edify the body. And the last place that it says it mentioned that um, David went to, we didn't read it, verse 31, it says he went to Hebron. He went to Hebron. The place of fellowship. The place of fellowship. It's in the fellowship we're going to find our strength. We're going to be united. The unity of the body of Christ until we all grow into a mature man to the measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. Is that a good God? Even in these Old Testament stories, we find Jesus. In these Old Testaments, these battles that seem to be so far from us, they go, what does it have to do with us in 2019? Everything. Absolutely everything. If you understand it, from the New Testament, it's a spiritual battle. From the New Testament, Christ has poured out his spirit upon the church. And boy, are we going to need it to strengthen the things that remain. If we strengthen the things that remain in the flesh, it'll just be a work of the flesh. We'll all be disunited. We'll all be mad at each other. We'll all be complaining and belly aching about things. But if it's of the spirit, then it's lasting. Then it's true. Then it's unity. And we all need to grow to the measure of Christ's stature. Shall we pray? Father, we're so thankful that you have poured out your spirit. And we give you, Lord, all praise and honor. Because you've used even people like us that you found, Lord. You found us on the highways and the byways. We were like that Egyptian, left for dead by the enemy. We once belonged to their camp. And you found us in three days, three nights, you rose from the dead and you gave us life. And you gave us gifts and you gave us nourishment and we joined your kingdom. And yet, Lord, you gave gifts unto us. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you do. And please, Lord, don't ever let us get to the point where we look back at Pentecost at something that happened historically only. But we will live with the fullness and the filling of the Spirit right now. Fill us, Lord God. Go on being filled with the Spirit, said Paul. Please fill us, Lord, with your love, your truth, and help us, Lord, to edify the body. Here in this conference, strengthen the things that remain. Help us to do it, Lord. We love to get the teaching. We love to get edified by others. But use us, Lord, to edify one another. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. amen.